Hey everybody, my name is Jordan Tenenbaum. I'm the social media manager here at Saligo and welcome to the Technology Leaders Podcast. As always, I'm with my co-host, Mark Simon, our Vice President of Strategy. Hello. Hi there. And we are joined with Chris Long, the SVP of Technology at Loop, the leader in e-commerce online returns. Um, Chris, fantastic to have you. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, absolutely. Very excited to be here. Thanks to you both. Absolutely. Well, let's jump right in. We got a whole bunch to talk about and never enough time as always. Um, I want to start out with the question that I always uh, start out with, but um, Chris, uh, in doing our background research, um, seems like you have a really interesting kind of rise in the technology leadership side of things, um, kind of beginning with an engineer, um, you know, working with code, working with programming, um, uh, eventually working your way up to the SVP role at Loop. Um, do you mind kind of telling us just a little bit about um, your story, kind of your background, like why you started where you did and how and how you got to where you are? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I've, I've told this story many, many times and you always kind of wonder where to start. But uh, in this case, maybe I'll start at the very beginning, uh, even though that's pretty far back. When I was 13, I found the uh, DOS prompt on an old Windows 3.1 machine in my buddy's <laughs> basic and, and found the QBasic uh, shell and just started getting in there and dorking around. Um, and realistically, this, the story then unfolds a little bit like, and I've been a straight line ever since then. Uh, as I've gone through my technology journey, I've certainly learned that the straight line uh, that I have run down the software engineering and then leadership path is actually the anomaly. I know a lot of people talk about, you know, picking their career and then running downhill at it, but uh, I really, really did that early. So I started writing um, and taking classes in high school, uh, which they had just kind of started doing, a uh, CS degree in college. Uh, went right into the consulting world and, and did a few years of that. Spent a few years at agency, really got my uh, feet under me there, uh, doing a lot of very uh, direct technical closing with some really big companies. And so got a chance to really lead teams, drive RFPs, design solutions for some really, really large enterprises across uh, the United States. And, uh, you know, that was where I really realized uh, I'm pretty technical, but I, I'm also pretty good with people and uh, leveraging that unique uh, skill set, which is still a bit of a niche today, is uh, something that I really wanted to, to build my career around. And um, that was it. I kind of started running downhill at some of the leadership stuff and building my management toolkit, so to speak. Um, continue to, to iterate on that and, and try and improve here uh, at Loop. Awesome. Well, thank you, man. I appreciate you uh, giving our guests a little bit of your background. And uh, always cool to hear when people kind of like discover something at an early age and it becomes our lifelong passion and, and talent as well. Um, and I think the next thing that we always like to hear is obviously Mark and I know a little bit about Loop and what you guys do, um, but could you talk about the inherent problem that Loop solves and, yeah. and what that does for your customers? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, as as as, as direct to con uh, consumer brands and e-commerce really have exploded over the last I don't know, 10, 20 years um, and the rise of the internet has given way for e-commerce first businesses. I would say that that the need for handling returns really evolved as a natural extension of growing online businesses. And in the early days, you know, there were these brands that uh, were doing lots and lots of orders and returns weren't a huge problem as they were scaling in the early days. But especially as they start to hit some of those like mid-market and enterprise size scale, returns just become a massive problem. And without a dedicated solution, uh, which Shopify, uh, some of the other you know, platforms out there, big commerce, uh, did not have. Uh, you know, the app ecosystem was relied upon to provide these solutions, and that's really where Loop was born. Uh, I always say Loop was born out of product market fit, but uh, we were uh, kind of born out of an agency that was building apps for Shopify customers. And by the fourth or fifth time, you're like, hey, we're having a problem with returns. Hey, we got a million returns. We can't manage these things. You go, okay, there's a product here. And uh, so really making it such that customers can see and manage all of the returns that consumers are doing with their business, uh, provide those refunds, provide those exchanges in an automated low cost way is really the bread and butter of what we do. You know, without that, you're back to email, phone calls, customer service agents. And, you know, it's both a really, really terrible consumer experience, as well as just a really costly way to operate the business for the brand. Uh, it's a very expensive way to manage um, something that's already a pretty loss heavy uh, part of the operation. That's a that's a fantastic way to explain it. And I think something that pops into mind that I, I feel like I learned this when I was in in college, but 
if, if, if you have a bad experience with a business and they solve it and make it right, 90% of the time, the customer will come back to your business. And in my opinion, one of the worst things to deal with as a consumer is returns. I absolutely hate driving to the UPS store and dealing with that kind of just riffraff. And the fact that you guys took something that's, it's so, I don't want to say obvious because that's almost a bit diminutive, but it's so important um, it, it, and made a, a business and an enterprise business, a product out of it is, is really unique. And I know we were talking a little bit um, beforehand uh, just about e-commerce and, and that side of things in general. So I'm going to open the floor to Mark, not that it wasn't open before, but I want to fully give him the baton, uh, if you will, because I'm sure he has some interesting thoughts and ideas and questions. Well, I, <laughs> thanks, Jordan. Well, I, you know, the, the returns, uh, let's just call it the problem of returns for an e-commerce business is just so universal. I mean, yep. I can think of, I, I'm, I've been working in, in e e-commerce space since the late 90s. And it's it's only just expanded. The problem's only expanded and grown, um, you know, to become even bigger than it was. I, and and this is where tools come in. I mean, good tools come in because there's it kind of hit on this a little bit, hinted on this a little bit earlier. But the there's there's two sides to it. There's an efficiency side to your organization. So you've got this drag. I always think of it as drag on the business. And just the the operational efficiency of the business, that's only and, and if you're not in return, seem to be this focal point for just about any e-commerce company I, I've worked with in the past is that if, if you don't, if you're not nailing that process, it's just this anchor pulling the business backwards. But I think what's really interesting is how that might have been the the primary concern for for so long, maybe. You know, let's say um, the, the the first two thirds of the last 20, 25 years, what's really shifted, I think, particularly in the last five or six years is really about it's the customer experience side is even yeah. more important. And I think what we saw during COVID was this interesting COVID and then the snapback from the pandemic. We saw this interesting play of those two things where customer experience became a little bit became an afterthought it was just about do you have do you have goods and can you get it out and can you can you do you have it to ship and can the customer get it and can you get it out the door and then what we saw when that sort of boom the boom around e-commerce just came back a little bit now all of a sudden customers are like no i want no. a good experience like and not just I want, like they're demanding a good experience. And I think it just put this this really big focus. And everybody's been trained. Everyone's been trained by these big e-commerce companies uh, that they work with, whether it's Amazon or anybody else, they sort of have an expectation. And I know as a small player, like there's no room as a, I think as a small e-commerce shop anymore. You can't really get by with a sort of funky returns process or one that's like uh not transparent and, and that's what i see is those those companies that aren't stepping up and finding a good solution to, to bring to meet that customer expert expectation on experience it doesn't the efficiency side doesn't even matter anymore like the the customers are going to choose and they're going to move in another direction and that's that's and i often see this as an afterthought for for e-commerce leaders is they're they're so focused on kind of the go to market and getting out there and getting launched and market side and and and, and the go to market strategy that they often miss out on on how much this impacts uh, customers. I'm, I'm curious, Chris, how you, yeah, if if that resonates, if that's what you see as well okay. out there with your customers. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, so you know, kind of touching on one of the important points you said there, which was um, around how the pandemic changed and shaped e-commerce, and obviously, you know. We've, we've been talking about that ever since it started. Um, but consumer experience is one of those things where when the pandemic hit, um, almost all shopping was online for the most part. And you had so many new uh, consumers and customers who were forced into that channel who maybe had been reluctant or were used to more traditional brick and mortar experiences. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, you know, returns uh, like it's not that the, you want to have a great experience, it's that you had to because it was the only way to, to, to navigate the process with your brand. And so all these consumers who hadn't even been exposed to online or digital returns are suddenly finding themselves, you know, trying to navigate this in an already stressful time. And that's the moment when I think a lot of brands, especially the ones who are looking at returns as a growth driver, 
um, saw the CX opportunity and said, okay, we can really do something powerful yeah. here and we can really create really strong retention. Uh, we can drive mm -hmm. brand advocacy and save costs. It's amazing how many of our uh, deals and, and merchants that we win today um, are we win because of our, our customer experience. And we've put a ton of product investment into making sure that not only can you drive cost savings with a good customer experience, and really we'll, we'll talk a little bit about like retaining revenue, because um, that's one of the things that we do really, really well also to help with that cost offsetting. Um, but, you know, they can create really powerful consumer experiences and keep them very specific to how they want to run their brand, which is so important to many of these customers is that they don't lose, you know, agency and autonomy in the experience, um, but that they've got the tools to create uh, what the consumer really expects. You know, you're right. Amazon is a trendsetter in all these things. And to some extent, you know, we're often finding ourselves broadly in e-commerce having to follow uh, some of what they're doing just because they're they're really driving the way on a lot of things. And consumers are expecting more and more differentiated and and really high-end, high-touch returns experiences. They they want more convenience. They want more options. They continue to want lower fees, which is an interesting push and pull in today's world. But you know, meeting the consumer's expectations for what the returns experience is like is just a critical piece um, for making sure that your brand's living up to consumer expectations today. Yeah, Chris, that's that's really interesting. Uh, the the uh, from a uh, as a uh, from an engineering and in building a product perspective, how are you balancing for your customers that that line between sort of what comes out of the box, here's the best practices, you should do it this way, versus giving them the flexibility to sort of manifest as a, as a you know, it not being e-commerce giants, how they manifest their their business personality in in the returns process and have that ability to, to customize where it makes sense. How, what, how do you draw that balance? What's And what is the right balance, really? Yeah, so I mean, certainly it's a... Uh... I'd say I spend many days thinking about that question, um, and it's and it's a, certainly an unsolved problem, but uh, one that gets a lot of focus from us. And I would say, you know, Loop uh, today spans a pretty broad footprint of merchants, and it's really just trying about understanding what each of those merchants are trying to do. Um, and so we have a capability within the platform called Workflows, which is just a really robust uh, step-based workflow and rules engine. Um, it's extremely extensible, very customizable. Uh, we believe it's one of the a key reasons that you know we've done really, really well in terms of maintaining great consumer experiences and giving brands the tools that they need to manage cost. And so, you know, a you gotta for your enterprise customers keep it really open. You know, they're expecting enterprise software where they can come in and kind of set things up however they want. Um, yeah, that means sometimes they can you know do dangerous things, um, and you want to try and help provide the guardrails there, but. You know, that's just the nature of enterprise software. And we're all, I think, pretty familiar with that. So um, you don't want to say no to anything that they want to set up in some cases. And you just got to make sure that the system stays really open and flexible. And then as we move down market, we're trying really hard to work on things like templating um, and things like, mm -hmm. you know, tools to help uh, use our data because we have an extremely rich, unique data set to figure out what those best practices are. And, you know, long term, we want to implement some of those things right into the product so that you just say, yep, I want the, the quote unquote easy path and, and Loop will figure it out for me. Um, and so it's really just about understanding that, you know, all three of those like tiers of customers just really need really different experiences. And it's about the willingness to invest in those custom experiences for them uh, because it, there's no one size fits all option for this stuff. And I think, you know, back to your point from a technology perspective, we've tried to make sure that the engine under the hood handles the most complex cases, but then that we can wrap up uh, that engine in nice, easy to use packaging for the folks who really don't need, you know, that level of power or don't have that level of sophistication to manage it on their own. That's a, that's awesome. So, so I have a question. Let's pretend I'm, I'm an e-commerce business. Uh, I was doing pretty well. I went on shark tank. I'm now hitting 5 million <laughs> annual sales a year. Um, and I, I lucked out. I have all these new customers. I have all this free advertising. My social medias are going crazy. Um, you know, maybe I'm not an e-commerce expert, but I, I have a great product and, you know, a, a great team. How do you talk to companies that are kind of in that super growth stage and help them realize that 
it's not necessarily about refunds, but it's about exchanges and it's about the analytics gathered from those returns and or exchanges. And, and like, how do you, how do you shift people's mindset to realize that this is more of an opportunity than a drag on business? Yeah. Yeah. It's a great question. Um, you know, there's an interesting push pull there with that segment specifically. Um, and they often are the ones, you know, right where you talked about, they start hitting that, you know, three, four, five million dollars in, in annual GMV and things start to break. Right. And one of the things that really starts to break is their inbox in their phone when they just got a thousand emails that they're following up on. Somebody's in the back just furiously trying to create and find and print shipping labels. And then when those things arrive at the warehouse, the warehouse is like, hey, what is this thing in a box that we got? Um, and so, you know, those customers in that segment are pretty aware of, I would say, a lot of the pain, but they don't know that the that there is an answer out there. And we're finding that, you know, even helping with um education is a key piece of this and that's a lot of you know what you're asking about which is like hey how do you get them understanding that it's not just about operating costs they do want to solve that and they come in wanting to to quell the madness so to speak but you know with a platform like loop those are the ones that also immediately understand that if uh let's just say i got you know i'm doing five million dollars in in gmv and out of that you know if if i'm re getting 20 percent returned right um and it's all getting refunded today that 20% is all going back out the door. And so they really latch on quickly when we start helping them understand that, you know, if instead of a refund, you can get that customer to do an exchange or a gift card um, and that that would be retained revenue. So that revenue stays with your uh, top line as opposed to exiting back out in the form of a refund. You just kind of watch their eyes light up, right? Because they really understand the impact of the top line of all those refunds going back out the door. So like, yes, their world is chaotic and crazy, but um, stopping the bleeding of, of all the, the, the transactions that they're refunding is also something that they really, really keenly understand. You know, some of our best customers, if, if you look at the ones that really apply our best practices um, and, and certainly, you know, uh, apparel's a vertical where this, this works really, really well as, as it's got a huge need in, um, returns and exchanges in general, but we see anywhere between like 57 and 80% retained revenue. So for every hundred dollars that was being refunded, some of our best brands are saving um, between 57 and 80 of those dollars are staying with the brand. Um, yeah, there's a cost to ship out the exchange. Yeah, there's a cost to process the return. But when you think about the total financial impact uh, that that's having on their business, it's, it's really mind blowing. And they understand how that helps their profitability. And of course, all of them, you know, it's it's moving rapidly from growth at all costs to sustainable growth, even in that segment. And so they immediately understand how, you know, it's it's a huge boon. That's uh, that, it seems like your your customer success managers probably have a, a very um, important role when it comes to the education side of things. But sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, Mark. Go ahead. Yeah, that's fine. I, you know, Chris, that that's really interesting. I mean, some of those numbers you said they're really interesting because some of the clients that I've worked at, with in the past in apparel specifically had well north of fifty percent return rate. And if you think they could get, they could get being able to achieve retained revenue, um, well, well, be you know in that range. I mean, that that that's a massive shift. So, right. Um, how do you how do you get your how do you get your customers to make those adjustments? What do you do with them? Is is it become less about the the product and more about best practices, or, or how do you how do you get them there, so to speak? Yeah. So and and certainly you know Jordan, you nailed it. We've got some pretty excellent CSMs, um, and our CSMs. I think we we run a pretty high touch um, merchant success organization, and it's one of the things that frankly we differentiate on. We've just got some really, really savage, um, uh, uh, what we call MSMs who, um, understand and care about this stuff deeply. And they certainly help a lot of our brands optimize. So I would say that that piece of it is, is really important, but, um, you know, for the most part, I would say, Mark, we've tried to, again, make it pretty easy, which there are a few really key levers, um, in terms of our product and, and how it's packaged that you can use and pull on. And, uh, what we do is we kind of put those things together in, in a suite. Right. So we do enablement for our customers. This is like, here are the things that are really going to drive this revenue retention outcome and kind of how you should set them up. And then, yes, there's an element of helping them customize, helping them make it specific. Um, 
But, you know, setting up that baseline experience, we feel like we've done a, a really good job of making that pretty simple because obviously it's it's just one of the core value pillars of the product. And we want to get it in as many hands as possible. We think it's a big, big driver. It sounds like you're 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 working and discussing to working to and discussing those those top level um business objectives like very like quantifiable ones revenue retention these return at these kpis very very early on and educate if they're not educated even educating yeah. customers on those and on the impact like like early it, yeah I, mean, I think i think brands fundamentally understand that like bad returns customer experiences lead to uh, attrition and again you go back to like what problems are they solving right now um, on the back of uh, social media changes, you know, privacy changes, their customer acquisition costs have just exploded. So it's it's more important than ever for them to make sure that they're keeping those customers and then retaining those dollars. And so they start to see this stuff and understand how it can offset or obviate some of those CAC costs. And mm -hmm. um, it's just a big deal. Um, they, they really get it. And I think it, to your point, they are important KPIs. And a lot of times it's ones brands aren't thinking about until they're sitting there in front of us. So again, we do a ton of education just to help people understand this view because it's it's still new, it's still fresh. You know, Some of these uh, things are only a few years old in terms of like brands really understanding these concepts at scale because the, the platforms have, have come a long way in the last seven or eight years. Um, and so there's a lot of education behind it. It seems like it's also uh, like something that pays off beyond just a positive customer experience or keeping money because what that does in terms of driving customer loyalty, like I said earlier, if you have a good experience, you're probably going to come back and do something again. And so there's just like layers upon layers of value that this very small, but important aspect of uh, online sales um, provides. And it's just very cool to see, see how you guys attack that from all angles and, and position yourself for customers. And again, apologies for cutting you off, Mark. Go ahead. So you, you see who's quicker to, to jump on in here, Jordan. Um, but but no, I, Chris, what's what's interesting to me here is to see some of the parallels um, that you're talking about in, in returns, how that parallels what we see in integration and simply in in the mid market customers like the, we find our customers do once they shift, they think when they think about things a certain way, once they they have a, a more mature philosophy yeah. and they, if they really understand how to apply best practices to their organization around automation, broader, more highly, they're thinking about it at a higher level, uh, moving to what we call automation first, we see this massive shift in in success, like like beyond what what any any like they could imagine or or you yeah. if you hadn't seen it before you could you could really guess um and so that puts a lot of focus on this education part and that's where i see this like big parallel and i've had lots of discussions about this uh but i'm curious your take on where's the who's really responsible for that best best uh, the, those education of the best practices and where to take advantage is that is that all the way up in marketing is it in sales is it in uh your your customer success your merchant you know, i think your merchant success managers who who really is responsible for that in the end yeah i'm i'm gonna give you such a such a such a cop-out answer right which is like especially right now I f it feels like it's everyone's job and, and i don't say that because it's an easy answer but um i actually think that that is the truth of of what it's like inside at least our organization today and certainly we take an extremely customer centric approach you know i'm i'm an engineering leader who believes you know my engineers should be talking to customers as often as possible understanding their pain points i mean they've got to really know what like human problems we're solving so they can have deep empathy for that and deliver the best solutions um but it is it is a it is an all company effort. And I would say that based on where the customer is in the funnel, we're talking about very different problems. And so I think the sales teams uh, likely talking more about, you know, why returns management matters. And they're trying to help brands who don't necessarily um, always get it. And certainly we get, you know, plenty of prospects who come in and they're like, we need this and we need this. And they understand the problem space really well. But some of that real like what is returns management education, I think happens up in, in sales and marketing. Our MSMs are really focused on optimization, I would say. Like, you know, once they've got folks in the door, they're trying to help with best practices. That goes all the way even deep into the logistics stack. 
So, you know, you talk about integrations and, and certainly I think how returns and integrations plays together is a, is a super interesting topic and, and something we could even spend time on because the, you know, it's, it's not necessarily just a problem of returns initiation in, in like our portal, um, but reverse logic or reverse logistics as an entire category has exploded in terms of investment in the last few years and how our technology connects with all those new players um, and even the existing players in the space is really important. And again, our MSMs are helping brands understand a lot of the impact of what's happening in the supply chain on the reverse side and how that can impact their business. And so then on the product and engineering side, you know, we're trying really hard to stay ahead of those things too, because all that stuff rolls down the line and, and ultimately is what shows up um, on our on our merchants' bottom line when you know Loop does or or doesn't you know solve certain problems. Yeah, that's that's interesting. And, and there's something there. You, you started to kind of mention like it's some of the trends you've seen. So re reverse logistics, for example, and and that becoming uh, focus and and sort of rising up as as a thing on its own. What what else are you seeing as trend like key emerging trends in e-commerce? What 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 do you what and where where do you think this is going? What do you see in your crystal ball? Yeah, so certainly, I mean. Um... I spent a lot of time looking at it because um, I, I think there's a, a lot of different ways this could go. But I've got, you know, a really strong belief that we've got some super interesting opportunities, um, I would say, to both really drive um, what I what I call the top end and the bottom end of the returns experience. Mm -hmm. And when I say that, what I mean is, you know, we want to continue to provide really great tools to detect and automatically provide incentives for a brand's best customers. Um, we want to continue to build extreme brand champions and advocates and a lot of what we've put in our technology allows for brands to to do that and create that very curated kind of vip experience um, because we think that's just going to continue to be really important and then of course you know all of our brands want to figure out well how do i turn that next layer of buyers into those advocates and so that graduation program uh, is something we think is really important going back to you know the cx of returns is is a real powerful lever to use to to drive consumer behavior. And then, you know, from a logistics perspective, um, gosh, there's there's so much moving here. It's really, really fascinating, but I would say there's a massive problem in how um, 3PLs and brands are able to, to partner together to uh, what we call disposition grade and process returns. So mm -hmm. if you think about how many of these things are coming back, especially now that e-com volume is up and, um, as a result, online returns are up, and that's why you know Loop exists. But the number of boxes that show up at warehouses that need opened, checked, is it damaged? Is it good? Can we resell it? How do we get it back on the shelves? You know, managing all of that inventory is a is a multi billion dollar problem in and of itself. Mm -hmm. And so Loop is very focused on, you know, creating and working with uh, partners and building tools to help manage that problem because it's really expensive for the brands. Um, there's a lot of lost inventory in that space and there's a lot of fraud that we're seeing starting to pop up in that space so loop is very focused on building out fraud detection you know fraud capabilities we want to give back to you know our powerful workflows engine our customers the tools to detect and manage these things in a way that fits their business practices um but you know i think those are some of the things that are, are really going to become more and more uh, right, right in our faces as we get through the next twelve to twenty-four months with returns. That that makes it that makes a ton of sense, and and having it actually brings me back to some things from, uh, uh, you know, uh, a, a while ago in my past. But I can think of being being a leader in an e-commerce company, and I mean, going down and spending time um, at the three PL. Uh, and walking the floor and sitting and walking through and designing and redesigning and going back and redesigning yeah. these these return disposition processes because they were uh, so hard to get right and they were never they were never done and uh, it was it was just you know you you kind of fix one problem and as soon as you think that that just means you've you you bring light to the next problem that you couldn't see because of the the three things that were yeah. in front of it. Um, but the value to impact a, a business there was was massive because just the amount of like hours and effort and time and whether they were, you know, our own internal resources or, or whether it was through our 3PL, you, you were paying for it either way. Um, right. and, and it was that that was huge. And being able to have something that's a little more turnkey, that's that 
takes account what type of business you are and what type of goods you're selling and, and getting return, but then can can lead the way. I, I don't know. That's just something where, you, you know, you always want to start with best practices and then, okay, are we doing something different because it's adding value or not? Right. And that that's always that was always a question we we grappled with was okay is this really adding value or are we are we really unique or not um yeah and that it, it depends it depends a ton too like you know vertical specific there matters a lot and we're seeing yeah um some verticals really struggle with it um because they need that what we would call inventory recovery like they need to get that product back in stock and resold yeah, yeah to your point it's you know fascinating we go out and look at these warehouses and you've got on one side the fulfillment and there's robots pick in and they're like picking and filling boxes and doing all this. And then you look over at the return side and it's just pallets and pallets of dented cardboard boxes uh, wrapped up in, in Saran wrap and, you know, like it's the, the Delta between how much technology enablement has been put into the, the reverse supply chain versus the forward supply chain. Again, it's, it's coming, but it's still so far behind uh, in terms of its level of optimization and sophistication that we think there's a big opportunity to help out there a bunch. And um, yeah, yeah, and that makes a, a lot of sense. You talk about the verticalization, and and I, a, a lot of my experience has been in with with seasonal types of goods, and and think of especially like in in some, like winter based sporting goods or, or summer based, yep. and you've got these windows, and and we would we, you know the value of your inventory, you go past the peak point in the season, and every day you hold it, it's worth less and less. Exactly right, and, and 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 so. If, if you get something that, that was returned and it's still sellable, and, and if you can get that back turned around quicker in a matter of days, it, the difference between days and weeks has a major material impact on, on the bottom line, just in the value yeah. if you're seasonal. Like and it's so interesting too, you know, back to your point on, on that, it's like, um, you know, we're working with a lot of logistics partners in the space and um, we work with a, a consolidation partner um, who our brands love and saves them a lot of money. And, you know, for the vast majority of things, it's a it's a fantastic um, offering such that they can consolidate all of those returns onto a pallet and then ship them back to the warehouse so that they're really saving on those those freight costs. But it adds anywhere between seven and 21 days to the restock time because of that additional hop. And wow. so brands are grappling like crazy with, yeah, it's it's saving me money. But is it am I am I making Am I making that money right. back in the end? Like, you know, especially you talked about seasonal or, you know, fast fashion consolidation is, I don't want to say it's a no op still, but I, don't, I just don't think there's a, an offering that's like enabled well for fast fashion yet in some of those things. And it's a real challenge for brands to figure out um, how to blend these things together. You know, again, certainly you asked where are things going, but I think Loop has a strong belief that, that brands are going to have to, much like they do today in many cases, they're going to have multiple reverse logistics offerings that they need to aggregate up and that are blended together in harmony to create this experience. And that's another place where, you know, with integrations, you know, pretty soon you're going to, if, if you didn't have a loop, you would need an integration with uh, DoorDash for pickups and happy returns for drop-offs and UPS and, and USPS and FedEx. And, you know, it's, it's not even just a matter of like, how do I get labels? It's, it's, how do I have all of the touch points, that I need in a really solid reverse supply chain um, strategy. Mm -hmm. And without a loop in place, it's really hard to, to spend the investment needed to build out all those integrations and connect all those systems because, you know, consolidation works well here, but direct box and ship works well here. And, you know, all of these things are just, it's very fragmented right now and, and <laughs> super interesting. So, we're coming up a little bit on time and I know I want to be respectful of everyone's uh, schedule and whatnot. Um, I have one question that I, I want to ask that touches on what you were just talking about, Chris, Mark. Um, I know you're kind of on a roll, so I just, I just wanted to let you know that we're coming up on time, but did you have anything before I, I jump in with my, my final question? Before your final question, uh, what I, what I'd love to ask Chris is in, in what, what brought it to mind was he meant, you mentioned the word consolidation and and in a different way that reminded me of some of the consolidation that's happening in the returns space and i just wanted to get chris's take on that and and what you know what's happening there in, in the in the return you know uh space and how that's impacting um the business and and you know how, how loop yeah. is, is is managing that yeah certainly it's um we're, we're seeing 
you know, obviously Loop, Loop is seeing some consolidation firsthand. We, we've recently entered into a, a strategic partnership uh, with a firm as they're shutting down their Returnly product. Returnly was another returns management uh, software business that uh, we were essentially directly competing with. Um, and at the same time, you know, in our partnership with a firm, uh, we're working to transmit transition as many of those merchants over to our platform as possible and provide continuity for continuity for them. Um, but we're we're seeing a, a pretty clear push um, towards you know one of two targets, and I think uh, the enterprise space and the M SMB space are really taking shape with what players are are dominating in each. Uh, it is really really hard to stretch both ends of that as it is in almost any line of business. And Loop is very focused on continuing to support the SMB and mid-market brands that we have, but also continue to serve our enterprise customers and grow with them, as I think that's where a lot of our growth is focused. Um, but we've you know, had a chance to thankfully be a part of some of that market consolidation, and uh, we're very excited to bring a bunch of the Returnly customers over. Uh, I think there's still going to be a lot of M&A happening as well uh, that spans both technology and logistics companies. Mm -hmm. Um, certainly on the 3PL and reverse side, you're seeing a ton of movement right now as startups pop up uh, solving some of these warehouse problems and and how they get either picked up uh, by some of the larger 3PL networks is something that I think is going to be a, a really key area to watch. Um, and we didn't even get to re-commerce. You know, how, how some of these goods get uh, not restocked but sent down to liquidation channels is, is another huge mm -hmm. opportunity over the next I don't know, three to 10 years as, as online brands are looking for those liquidation channels that traditional retailers have and the, the movement in that space between uh, what we would call both the pixels and the parcels is just is just massive right now. So it's super interesting to watch. Awesome. Well, thank you. I appreciate that, Chris. That's a super insightful answer to, to Mark's question. Um, I actually have two final questions, so I'll, I'll try to keep try to keep the second one a little shorter, um, but we touched a little bit about the similarities between um, like Siligo and the iPass world and uh, Returnly in the e-commerce world. Um, we're obviously an integrations company, uh, an automation company. I'm just curious uh, because it seems like the e-commerce world, like you mentioned, is relatively fragmented um, where there's, you know, email marketing tools and then return tools and then, um, platforms to sell on e-commerce and there's all these different um you know usps and ups and fedex and you know all these things and i'm just curious what what do integrations i don't want to say mean for you but i guess how do you address the this massive need for integrations um and, and how i guess important is it to um to your business yeah, it's such a good question. And I, again, it's another one of those ones that uh, at various points probably kept me up at night. Um, <laughs> because, and I think for many of us, that's probably true as we try to figure this out. Uh, but I've really settled on on uh, maybe the following uh, strategy in my mind or a response to your question, which is, you know, it depends on what kind of integrations you're talking about, of course. Um, but if we think about, you know, an iPad solution, uh, you're trying really hard to be a really great pipe and connect things, have really good good mappings, really high data quality, you know, synchronization of things across various spaces. And that's something you guys know and love. It's like the bread and butter of, of a lot of what you do is, is just creating that connectivity. Uh, we don't really want to play in, in that space at Loop. What we do want to do is be the quote unquote orchestrator of all of the post-purchase touch points, right? And so that's what we think is really important about our platform is we're the ones who know about all when all the things happen when the customer placed the return, when they got their mm -hmm. shipment, when they got, and you know, that's where we wanna work with uh, both our technology partners, the Clavios of the world that so many of our brands use to, to help mm -hmm. send the right communications at the right time. But really the way that I think about it is that we own the timeline a little bit, just because that's where the that's where the activity is happening. You know what I mean? The, the yeah. consumer is on the portal, the 3PLs calling our API in real time, the merchants are processing returns in real time on our portal. Um, and so, you know, trying to find like where do we play really, really well um, and where can we leverage partners really, really well and, and reduce some of that confusion. I think that's a, a kind of how we've settled on it. And, you know, we want to have great connecting relationships that give us access to lots of other partners uh, through iPaaS platforms like Soligo. Um, and then we want to make sure that we're driving additional value by saying, hey, we know when these things are going to happen and we can call the right system at the right time, even if, you know, it's happening through um, one of our partners. And so... 
you know, again, trying to find our, our spot, so to speak, because it is a huge wide, um, you say uh, integrations and it's, it's the largest word in the world in our space sometimes as, as again, you guys know. And so that's where I like to think that loop plays really, really well on what it means to us. Fantastic. That's a, it's a great way to put it. I, uh, I used to, out of college, I started an e-commerce business and uh, integrations were the bane of my existence. That was in the early <laughs> shop. Yeah, was, that was the early Shopify days. And I don't, I'm not technical. So props to you guys for orchestrating, um, as you mentioned. Um, so uh, in an effort to avoid you getting in trouble uh, with your wife and kids, um, we're going to wrap things up. Um, the way that I always end these uh, podcasts is I like to say that vice presidents and C-level people, uh, C-level leaders are, are not robots. You guys are people too. Um, just for the folks who are still listening, um, tell us just a, like completely removed outside of work. Uh, what are you into? What are your passions or hobbies? Do you like race cars? Do you like ancient history? Um, what are you What are you into? Just to just to give you a little rounding out, if you will. Yeah. Before we end. I, love, I love that question, and and I you know my short answer is I'm a hobby collector, which means I could spend days <laughs> answering this question. Um, but yeah, obviously husband and father first, uh, you know, I've built a lot of my life around, uh, trying to create a great life for my family. Um, and my kids who are six and three are just like, they're, they're kind of my everything right now. And I spend a lot of time, um, just surviving and thriving with them. Um, <laughs> six and three is a lot of fun, but, uh, really quickly, you know, my, my passions for the most part are, um, I like to play golf. I don't get a chance to do it nearly as much as I used to, but it's a it's a fantastic game uh, that forces me to be very mindful, which I think in today's world is a a challenge mm -hmm. at all times. And so a a a, a game that um, has that baked into the requirements is something I just find a lot of joy in. Uh, still like playing video games. I, I'm a classic classic nerd. Uh, have always been a classic engineering nerd. Uh, still run a D and D group with some of my friends, and and so lean really hard into that stuff. But uh, on the weekends, you'll find me in my backyard, probably smoker or grill fired up, uh, maybe also enjoying a glass of bourbon. I've got a, a decent collection there, too. And and otherwise, just kind of hanging out. I like entertaining, having people over, cooking for them, you know, having a cocktail and, and just um, enjoying the humid Ohio summer nights. So that's awesome, man. I think that people are going to love to uh, to hear that about you. Um and I just want to say, uh, before you go wrangle those kids, um, thank you a ton for for being a guest here. This has been incredibly insightful um, to anyone in the either e-commerce integration, uh, Shopify, whatever this space is that we're that we're discussing. I think there's so much that people can um, learn mm -hmm. at return space as well. But there's just so much that people can pick up and learn um, from from you, Chris and Mark. Uh, as always, thank you for being an excellent co-host and peppering in some some super insightful questions. Um, for everyone listening, I'm Jordan. We have our guest, Chris Long, uh, SVP over uh, at Loop, and Mark Simon, my co-host, who's the Vice President of Strategy at Sligo. Thank you guys for joining the Technology Podcast, and we'll see you all next time. Have a great day, everybody. Thank Bye you. Now. Thank you.